Isaiah 6, 1 through 4. But 6, 1 and 4 tells us this. I saw the Lord, and the temple was filled with smoke. Is that a truth? Just filled with truth? Now, we're more inclined to think if we saw the Lord, everything would become clear. Or, I saw the Lord and the world was filled with light. That makes sense. But personal experience and a close look at Scripture shows that the very entrance of God can make life more complex and more confusing than we ever dreamed. This much is clear. Jesus Christ made our faith more difficult because he made it more profound and therefore more more complex. What are we going to do with him? If you stop reading your Bible at an enlightened biblical Judaism, there's complexity enough. But when Jesus comes on the scene, the mind begins to dance like a dervish. And the cross, what are we to make of that? If God were more like ourselves, we could muddle our way through without the cross and settle for a God easily understood. Well, more easily understood. But would we want a God more like ourselves? Is it not true that it's the fact that he's so unlike us that makes him precious to us and important to us? You understand, I'm not suggesting that we should exult in ignorance or that we should bury the joy-filled obligation of pursuing rich truth about God. I am saying that we should rejoice in the truth that he is forever beyond our comprehension. Not simply because we are so tiny, but because he's, well, infinite. I'm not suggesting that we should profess that he's utterly unknowable. Because he's made himself known in truth. What we know of him in Christ is true. But it's not exhaustive. It's certain. But it's not complete. The good news is that we don't have to know him completely to find ourselves complete in Christ. It's God's glory that blinds us. It's His holy love that fills the temple and the world and our lives with smoke. We just can't grasp it. The comforting word that we rightly and hopefully with wisdom and good timing give to so many great sufferers The comforting word fills the temple of their experience with smoke. We say, God loves you. The sufferer says, He loves me? If He loves me, then why this or that or the other? We've come a long way from Moses on Mount Sinai when God told him, you will not see my face. But there's always going to be that distance between God and us, a gap that can never be closed. We'll make our educated guesses at where history is going, or God help us, we'll claim revelations from God himself that seem to change with the headlines in the newspapers. But wise men and women are slow to point to footsteps and say they're gods. Colin Morris was furious with those who, he said, 
hadn't a clue about what was going on in the head of their pet poodles. But knew within an inch what God is going to do with the economy in our nation's foreign affairs or with the balance of weapons of mass destruction. That really hacked him off. Isaiah spoke of God's strange work. That's what he called it in chapter 29. And God tells Habakkuk in chapter 1 that no one would believe what he was going to do, even if they were told. Like tens of millions of others down the years, I know from personal experience that the smoke can be distressing. But in the final analysis, it's to our benefit in more ways than one that we don't understand everything. This much is sure. No matter how thick the smoke, no matter how deep we penetrate into it, we'll never discover someone horrible or hateful or indifferent hiding in it. For God is like Jesus Christ and in him there is nothing unlike Christ at all. The last word in Isaiah's experience is not, Woe to me, I am ruined. The last word was, See, your guilt is taken away, and your sin is atoned for. The smoke and the mystery and the bewilderment it generates are real enough. But because we believe that the one shrouded in smoke and mystery is for us and not against us, we have assurance and strength. Assurance that the smoke hides nothing that is sinister or malevolent or cruel. It's precisely what we need. And because it's well founded that it is what we need, we have strength to rejoice even in the fog. It isn't simply a matter of understanding that there's mystery. It's more than that. For us, the call is to trust the one who's hidden in the smoke, to wish him well in his purposes and to throw ourselves into his work with a will, without exhaustive answers to all our questions. That's what we're called to. If out of the smoke comes the word of forgiveness and atonement, and the word that he trusts us to go for him, then we can live without a divine almanac that has all the answers to all our questions. Isn't there something tantalizingly fine about the promise that the pure in heart see God. Hmm.